here in this room is a will. What is it, Webb? A blip, sir. Just came on the screen. How do you read it? Aircraft of some sort. By the size of it and the speed. It's not one of ours, sir. It doesn't even read like anything I've ever seen. What was the approach? None, sir. It was just there, like it fell out of the sky or something. Current position? Directly over the Omaha installation, sir. Holding there. Watch the scope, Webb. Air defense will want to send somebody up to get a closer look. I think we have a real UFO on our hands. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode we're going to be taking you back to year in 1953 to look at the Kinross UFO incident. Now if you've never heard of this one, let me give you a brief synopsis here. Basically it's a United States Air Force fighter jet intercepting a UFO on the radar screen and then 30 minutes later the fighter jet disappears the United States Air Force send out a search team and they can find no trace of the jet and up to date it's become a mystery and obviously UFOlogists believe that it was a UFO and that perhaps the pilots had been whisked away to another planet with the aliens or the jet was destroyed by the UFO so there's lots of different ideas and that's what I'm here for today to look into this incident and um, we'll have a little bit of fun with this because before I move on to the actual incident itself, I think um, when I think of the 1950s United States Air Force in particular, it kind of reminds me of like, you remember the old comics like Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future. You've got a pilot with his flat top haircut, um, sort of chiseled, jawed hero. And when you look at the, the planes from this time, they do look futuristic. Especially the plane that was involved in this one. This It was a F-89 Scorpion. Now if you haven't seen one, check it out. There's it's a good chance that you have seen it on TV or movie somewhere. It's a beautiful twin engine plane. It's got that silver fuselage. And on the tip of the wings it's got like two uh, torpedoes. It just looks like it should be flying into space. And um, there was lots of different planes like that back then. There was the... Thunderstreak, the Starfire, they even had a plane called a Starfighter and uh, like I say check them out on Google they're just beautiful 1950s comic looking planes and the other thing is back in this time it's after World War II I think that the astronauts, oh, well the pilots and you also had astronauts doing like test flights for like um, I think it was like Project Gemini and Mercury and you had Gus Grissom with the X-15 flying into um, the tip of space. I really think that they thought they were going to go places into space. And obviously it's quite an exciting time because you had, whether you believe it or not, you had the um, Apollo moon landings, which obviously were later on in 1969, which I think was kind of like the pinnacle of this venture. And I think after that, it kind of just went downhill after. And then obviously you still had the um, the Cold War back then. So I think that was like the Americans trying to advance their technology to have like the sort of bigger guns than, than the other. But um, yeah, I thought I'd just give you that sort of, it's just the night, it's the 1950s. So with all that technology and those planes and the pilots, you would almost expect UFOs to turn up as well. And even some of the films at that time, like uh, The Forbidden Planet and This Island Dear Earth, they had that aesthetic. And then obviously you had like, I think they kind of called it like the the atomic age. So uh, there was all these um, possibilities at, at no end. So it's quite an exciting time, quite a terrifying time as well, I'd imagine. Um, so I thought it's important to talk about that because it kind of creates the mindset for everybody as well at that time with um, this, this atomic age. So when the United States Air Force come out with a story to say that a fighter jet has possibly um, scrambled a UFO and then disappeared, you can see why 
um, conspiracy theorists at the time might believe that. Because obviously, and the other thing to mention as well, you also had Roswell as well back in 1947. So um, this was kind of like on the back foot of the uh, mother of all UFO conspiracies. So let's go back to the incident itself. So it was, um, let's talk about Kinross uh, United States Air Force Base. It is based on the top end or the north end of uh, Lake Michigan. And it's built during World War II as a purpose to basically protect the Sioux Locks. So it's basically a shipping lane between two lakes on, on North America and then it borders Canada as well. So basically this, this Air Force base is to, to protect America itself from any enemies. And obviously during the Cold War as well at this time. So on the evening of 23rd of November 1953, the Air Force Base uh, detected a blip on the radar of an object, quite a large object, um, flying over Lake Mich Michigan. So they intercepted the F-89 fighter jet, well, which is the Scorpion as I've already mentioned, which can actually get up to about 650 miles an hour. And the two pilots involved were Felix Moncola Jr., a uh, very experienced fighter pilot. He had 811 flight hours. And Robert Wilson, who was the navigator, also had similar flight hours himself. So very experienced. They launched, intercepted the object. And they said it was a very fast moving object, which they could just keep up with. Bearing in mind that the Scorpion can travel at 650 miles an hour. And they pursued... Uh, this object for 30 minutes and then they lost radio transmissions and then the radar operator could, could see the scorpion intercepting the, the large blip and then the scorpion approaches the uh, blip on the radar and then almost like a amalgamates and then disappears and then you've got the large object left on the radar which then just vanishes, it just shoots off at high speed and, and disappears. After this event, a search was conducted, but there was no sign or trace of the wreckage or, or the pilots. Um, there was talk that the weather conditions weren't great, it was very icy conditions, but it was still uh, reasonably visible. Um, but, but to this day, there's been no trace of the wreckage or the pilots. Now, Doing the research for this, um, I try to do as much um, extensive research as I can. What I did notice was there was no real logs of radio transmission between the pilots and the communication tower. So usually, I mean, I've done the, um, I did the one with the Avenger bombers that disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle and there was some communications, but with this one, um, I couldn't really find anything, any like last transmission of the pilot to say, well, what is this thing that I'm looking at? I'm pretty sure there might be something that they, they would have communicated back to say, yeah, I'm intercepting this object and maybe give you some description of it. Now, whether that is top secret or not, so I'm not really able to help with that unless there is anybody out there that um, does know it and I've just... I've just somehow sort of skip past it so so it really is a little bit sort of cloak and dagger this one I think there's a record that there what the, the scorpion did go out and intercept a, a UFO of some kind and then has disappeared but there's lots of uh, mystery here involving the disappearance because I would imagine as a experienced fighter pilot if you was having problems you'd get back to control and say either I'm ejecting I've got a malfunction or I'm suffering some sort of vertigo I'm going to have to abort or you know there's there's some sort of malfunction in the plane I'm sure there would have been a some sort of communication going back there or it might just be the case that they have just lo lost communication so as an investigator that would actually be my my first question let's have a look at the communication logs and see what the pilots are actually saying now this moves on to the actual contact the united states air force contacting the press to to release a statement to say that we have lost a fighter jet to a ufo and believe it or not that is what they said so we kind of got like a little bit of a roswell thing going on here where 
at first they come out and actually say, yeah, the United States Air Force have found a UFO. And in this case, the Kinross Air Base have released a statement to the press saying, yep, yeah, we've lost a fighter jet to an unidentified flying object. Then they do a Roswell again on them and later on retract that statement and say that the fighter jet has just crashed and in actual fact we just intercepted a Canadian uh, C-37 Dakota which is the um, one of those planes that you would see if you've ever seen Band of Brothers where they it's, like, it's basically like a troop carrier um, okay so <laughs> one minute you're saying it's UFO and now you're saying it's a Dakota now my question to that would be why did they not just come out and say it was a Dakota in the first place and when I looked at this, I thought, well, if it was a Dakota, first of all, you've got a fighter jet that flies at 650 miles an hour, pursuing or trying to keep up with a Dakota, which is the top speed of 250 miles an hour. Um, so there's a hell of a difference there. And surely this goes back to the radio communication where one of the pilot, the experienced pilot, would come out and say, "It's okay. It's a it's a Dakota that's come up on 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 the on the radar. So we're going to pull back and come back home." So yeah, it, the, that is where you got your first discrepancy there in, in this case. And I can imagine this is the reason why the old ufologists are going, "Oh, hang on a second. How come you're saying this story and now you're telling us this one?" So you can see why this mystery now evolves. So in this case, um, as an investigation, that's your first building block. You've got a statement that has been changed to the press. The other thing is um, the, the widow of one of the pilots was told two different stories as well. She said that the, the Air Force told, told them that um, her husband had suffered vertigo. Um, and then that is the reason why the plane had crashed and then they gave her another statement to say that um, the plane had suffered a malfunction and that's the reason why the plane had crashed. So you've got many different statements here from the Air Force which kind of contradict the case. And now going back to the uh, C-47 Dakota plane, it was a Royal Canadian plane that they're saying that the Scorpion had intercepted. Uh, the Canadians actually say no we didn't have any planes and there were no pilots saying that they flew over Lake Michigan on that day so there was no no planes of that type flying over the lakes from the Canadian Air Force and that's kind of strange and now let's fast forward to 2006 and you've got a company called the Great Lake Dive Company um, a guy called Preston Miller who states in August 2006 he actually conducted a search of Lake Michigan and came up with some prizes. He claims that he found the wreckage of the Scorpion and he also found the wreckage of what he believes to be a metallic disc. So could this be the part of the flying saucer? Um, he's provided pictures. These are pictures that you can find off Google and it actually does look like a Scorpion. And the metallic disc actually looks like a, a teardrop. And there are investigators who have looked at these pictures and they said that um, they can't be hoaxes. And this kind of becomes like a sort of mystery within a mystery because as soon as this was released, um, it turns out that basically in a nutshell here, guys, is that Preston Miller and the Great Lake Dive Company, there is no such thing. So this is claiming to be a hoax, or is it just the fact that there was a Great Lake Dive Company and the whole thing's been covered up by the government? You know, if you want to chuck in a conspiracy, you might have had this Preston Miller who actually conducted a search, he's found some evidence, and it could just be that the government don't want people to release that evidence to the public. So yeah, it, it kind of becomes like a mystery within a mystery. But what I think, I think this myself, I mean, that's one way of looking at it, but I think it is just a case of someone chucking in a hoax to say, look, I found it, but it's it's all a load of rubbish because um, the only details that the Great Lake Dive Company had was an email address and a telephone number, and then that all soon disappeared as soon as people started asking questions. So, so far up to date with this mystery, it has remained 
I would say inconclusive to what's happened to to this aircraft. Like I say, you've got a couple of theories that it's, as I've mentioned already, with the, the Dakota, and then obviously the Great Lake Dive Company, which don't exist, saying that they they found it. So yeah, there is there are a couple of um, loose ends, I, I would say, here. What, what I mentioned earlier, I think one of the big ones would be the radio transmission. Um, if you could listen to those tapes, I think they'll probably be able to tell you. So yeah, I think it's one of those ones where you kind of look at it and you kind of make your own mind up. I suppose what you could say realistically is that the Scorpion intercepted something. It's had a malfunction, it's crashed and they couldn't find it. It does seem a bit strange that they've lost this plane and they couldn't find it on their own turf. I appreciate that the Michigan lakes are probably quite deep and they're quite vast. But it does seem a bit strange that there's no wreckage at all uh, floating around anywhere or no one's found anything up till today. Um, and then you've got the sort of discrepancy where they're, they're saying that it's a Dakota plane. That one kind of nudges me a little bit because you've got a 650 mile per hour fighter jet intercepting something that cruises at 200 miles an hour. I can't really see that. I mean, I'm not a pilot myself, but that just doesn't really sort of um, sit well with me at all, really, thinking about that one. And then obviously you've got something that has come up on the radar, which is moving quite quick. And yeah, there's there's obviously something that has turned up and something that has made the Air Force intercept. So let's have a look at what the UFO conspiracy theorists think. They think it was a UFO that turned up and it's quite possible that... Um, the pilots had been transported onto this vessel and then obviously the vessel was zoomed off and then these guys, you know, have become a bit like sort of Buck Rogers or something like that, whisked off to another plane. I know it seems crazy, but that's where, where some people think, you know, so I've got to throw that one out there. Um, so yeah, it, it, it could just be that a UFO was turned up. Um, that's one of the theories or the other one I think um, just throwing this one out there is obviously you've got the Cold War going on at the moment um, so you've, you may have the Russians with equal technology maybe some advanced technology because obviously you had the space race here going on you had one trying to outbeat the other could it have been that there was some Russian technology that was flying over um, American and Canadian soil and the Air Force Base have intercepted it with one of their crafts and then it could have been that uh, the Russians have, have, have blown up um, a United States aircraft and then obviously the government don't want to release that because it's going to cause, cause some tensions and it's going to perhaps maybe say that the Americans have got a little chink in their armour today because the, Ameri uh, the, the Russians have technically blown up a, a craft over American soil. Possibly. It, it, it could be the reason why you get a cover-up and then the government don't want to release that um, to the public and then people start speculating that it's a, it's, it's a UFO and then I've always thought that the government have thought, well if the government, if the people want to believe that it's a UFO, then that's might not be a bad thing because that can cover up all the uh this will actually help cover up what what actually goes on so it might even help the government i've always thought that with uh, ufos it's kind of like another cover-up over a cover-up and i think that's why we never really get to any sort of conclusions with this but there you go um as i always say that's that's what i've brought to the table t today there's like a little bit of um some some facts and figures uh, to make your own mind up about it. But as I said at the beginning, it's the 1950s. It kind of just broadens your imagination. It does feel like that sort of Dan Dare time. Um, so yeah, have a look into it. Uh, make sure you check out the the Scorpion plane. It is a, actually a really beautiful looking plane. Um, but it's just going to remain open. Maybe one day we might get a, get a file from, from the Air Force that may release some more, more content. And I think the actual key here will be the uh, radio transmissions but right now it will remain a mystery in the mystery vault so before i
close the show. There's another thing I want to mention here as well. There's, um, I checked this out the other night. Remember um, Star Trek from the 1960s with Captain Kirk and Captain Spock? There's a really good episode, which I believe is connected to this incident. It's an episode called Tomorrow's Yesterday, and it's where the Starship Enterprise um, accidentally goes back to Earth in 1960, and a similar type of plane, I think it's a Starfighter um, plane, intercepts the Enterprise and the pilot gets beamed on board and then they've got to try and get him back. And when I was watching that, I thought this is just a take on the uh, Kinross instance. So there you go, it's another theory. It could just be that the pilots are with Captain Kirk and the Starship Enterprise. So if you haven't seen the episode, check it out. It's really good. It's, it's, it goes back to what I said here. It's got that real sort of like 1950s type of Dan Dare pilot. Um, meeting up with the crew of the Enterprise and it's a lot of fun. I forgot how good those um, those uh, TV shows were. So I will leave it on that. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, let's do a little bit of uh, admin for the show. I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network so please check out all the other shows including my other show, the Bite Size Cinema Podcast where I just um, released an episode called Clue from 1985, which was a whole ton of fun with uh, Cork Sarts from Cinema Sarts Podcast. Um, you can find me on Facebook. That's the best place to contact me. And if you want to listen to the show, there's, there's plenty of places out there you can listen to it. It's um, YouTube, Spotify, um, iTunes, several other players. If you put in the Mystery Vault Podcast into Google, it takes you somewhere where you can listen to the show. So there you go, people. Um, keep it spooky, keep it safe, and I will see you soon. Because one of you, sitting here in this room, is a whale. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.